Recording in progress. Welcome. I am calling to order this meeting of the Select Board on Monday, November 7, 2022. I am Select Board Chair Leonard Diggins, and I will now confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda Recording are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. John Hurd? Yes. Steve DeCorsi? Yes. Eric Helmuth? Yes. And Ms. Mahan is not going to be joining us tonight. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Sandy Pooler? Yes. Doug Heim? Yes. Ashley Meyer? Yes. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted in a hybrid format consistent with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022 signed into law on July 17, 2022, which further extends certain COVID-19 measures regarding remote participation until March 31st, 2023. Before we begin, please note the following. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom. It is being recorded and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Second, persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that you may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. Third, all participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call. So let's see how much of the town's business we can get done. But before we go into the next item on the agenda, I just want to note that um, Mrs. Mahan is not joining us tonight because of um, um, some health issues in her family, uh, in particular her mom. And so she asked me that uh, we keep her mom, especially in our thoughts and prayers, being in. and we'll be keeping her and her family you know, um, in our thoughts as well. And, uh, so next on the agenda is the land acknowledgement. I would like to read the land acknowledgement that the board supported in the spring of 2021, and that was adopted at the 2021 annual town meeting. <coughs> Excuse me. We acknowledge that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous, excuse me, indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. Now, on to item three on tonight's agenda. Given the passing of our dear Marie Capalco on the evening of October 25th, we would normally observe a moment of silence, but since she was on board at men for over 20 years, we are going to talk about her. As I mentioned at our last meeting, as we acknowledged her retirement, I was in the process of inviting former board members who had worked with Marie during her tenure as the board, if they would like to join us to share some thoughts about her. The circumstances are different than what I had in mind at the time, but in some respects, it is even more appropriate to hear from her former members anything that they wish to share about Marie. So starting with the member who was, that was elected to the board uh, earliest, you know, uh, we're gonna start with Charlie Alliance, is he in? You yes. know, so he was elected in 1981 and he served till 2005. So he had a four year overlap with Marie, uh, Mr. Lyons. Lines. You can unmute yourself. It seems like you're unmuted, so you can talk whenever you want. sure what to make of this. So I tell you what, we're going to keep you in as a panelist, Mr. Mr. Lyons. And, um, and, and what I'm going to do now is I am going to go to uh, Mr. Hurd, who was elected in 19, 
97 and served to 2011. And so he was on the board with Marie for about 10 years. And so I'll go to Mr. Hearn and then I'll check back with you, Ms. Alliance. We'll just keep, in check, keep in checking back until we get you. And if um, there are some problems and maybe you can put something in the chat, we can maybe help troubleshoot that. So Mr. Hearn. Yourself, Mr. Hard? I don't think he's a panelist yet. He's not the panel. right. He hasn't accepted it yet. Might take a minute. Some of these older select board members aren't quite as <laughs> Zoom savvy. <laughs> he's in. He just has to unmute himself. All right. I guess I saw, I saw them all on my screen here, so I figured they were all in as panelists, but, uh, Can you hear me? Yes. Am I on? Yes, you're on. Yes, you are. We can all hear right. you. I can't see you, but we can hear you. I can't see you, but I can hear you, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go with that. So thank you uh, for inviting me, and uh, I understand there's other former select board members that will be joining us. Um, it was quite an honor to, uh, to know Marie. Um, I think it's been said many a times, she was one of a kind, uh, amazing town employee, a loving and very proud mother and grandmother, of, uh, three hockey players, and, and a loyal friend. I first met Marie uh, in the 70s, actually, I was coaching her son, Paul, as a mite way back then. I was just a young person myself, and I'm proud to say, um, I've called her a, a close friend ever since. And, uh, you know, when the board administrator position became available, uh, we knew a, a nationwide search wouldn't be necessary. It was just a matter of convincing Marie to make the transition from Grove Street, uh, another job in the town that she very much enjoyed and excelled at. And I think we can all agree, uh, we're glad she made that change. So um, Marie, as a board administrator, she was like the sixth member, never shy in voicing her opinion, and always looking out for the best interests of the board and the town. Marie was loved by many and she'll be sorely missed. And, um, you know, it was a great tribute to Marie uh, the day of her funeral to come down Mass Ave and be part of that with the uh, firefighters out front, town employees in front of the building. Um, that was really special. And um, she would have been very proud of that. And uh, I want to give the town manager and others credit for that. So um, quite a tribute to a very, very long run as a town employee and friend in Arlington. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. That was wonderful. Appreciate it. You know, so um, next we're going to hear from Frank LaCourte, and who was on the board from 2005 to 2012. And, and I'll just say we can go ahead and maybe put all the folks like in, in, in this panelists, you know, we can leave them in. Yeah. Mr. Court, <laughs> I can see you and I can hear you, so you're on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, yes, um, I'm, I'm very sad to hear of Marie's passing, um, and uh, uh, I'm uh, very pleased, though, to be able to come and, you know, publicly um, talk about the time that I spent on the board and the great support that Marie was to me as she was to all the members of our community. Um, when I was elected to the board, uh, I wasn't really expecting to be elected to the board. And um, I believe that some of my then colleagues were a little shocked that I got <laughs> elected to the board. Um, and so it was really, really great. Um, I mean, I have to also give credit to Jack who was very supportive, but Marie was um, really, really helpful in helping me to understand sort of the logistics of the meeting and uh, to serve as a sounding board for any questions that I had. She was uh, uh, always cheerful and always honest. Um, and um, always, I, I could always speak to her confidentially about things I was struggling with. Um, 
So it was a really great honor to serve with her. And I know that she uh, treated everyone from um, citizens she didn't know all the way up to people she worked with for years the same, with the same level of cheerfulness and willingness to get the job done and um, support. Um, my first conversation with her when I decided to run was kind of an interesting one. <laughs> she was a town meeting member and I also knew she was the administrator and I needed to uh, give her a call because I was calling everybody in the town meeting. Um, and she was very, very gracious about um, saying, you know, it's great that you're running even though obviously she was invested in uh, the support she was giving to the current members. And um, it was, a remarkably non-awkward conversation given the circumstances. And that was really how our relationship started and continued uh, to be able to be honest and to be, um, uh, you know, to just talk about anything we needed to talk about. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. LaCourt, appreciate that. And so I'm gonna circle back to uh, Mr. Lyons. Mr. Lyons, can you, can you speak? Okay, well, we'll keep coming back. And so next um, we'll go to Calissa Rowe. Ms. Rowe um, was on the board from 2006 to 2012, and then again in 2018, and then yet <laughs> again in 2019. You know, so, so, so she just couldn't get enough, and who knows, it's still time. You know, so, so. No, 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 Lynn. <laughs> Ms. Rowe? Yes, hi. Um, it's so nice to see you, all of you including my past colleagues. Um, it's fascinating. 10 years ago, our former town manager asked me, he said, do you think Marie will retire? And I said, no. And he said, um, do you think her sons will ask her to retire and she'll do it? I said, no. <laughs> and basically she never retired. She died the day before she was supposed to retire. And that's the way she wanted it to be. She had a will to live and most importantly, a will to um, serve. <clears throat> she was a font of knowledge. She knew everybody in town. She knew what church they went to, who their grandfather was, who their cousins were. And it was just fascinating to sit with her and figure out all the, the family histories of the people that she'd known for so well, for so long. And as everybody else has said, Mostly, she was a great friend to us, the, the select board. Um, she was loyal, as Jack said, and she kept us in line with her laugh, her loyalty, and her unflagging love for the town. She was also very funny. She loved a good gossip. She was rarely mean, but sometimes she was. And she was just fascinated by people. I, I miss, miss her a lot. I know we all will, and I know this town will. And I send my condolences to her, her son Paul, her son Stephen, and his wonderful family. She bragged about those, that granddaughter, Maddie, and uh, also to her third son, Michael Byrne, and his family. Thanks so much for letting me talk. You're welcome, Ms. Ms. Rowe. And yeah, I was actually thinking myself that some people you know, can't wait to retire, but Marie apparently did everything she could to avoid retiring. And so, uh, Mr. Lyons, I see you here, and hopefully you can speak. Your, your microphone is still muted. We have a video, I think we just need to unmute. <clears throat> we're gonna hang with you for a little more. Oh, I see you not on camera anymore. So I tell you what, we're gonna go on to the next person and come back, but I think we're making progress here. So, so I have hope you know, that we'll get you on. You know, so next we'll go to, Dan Dunn, who was on the board from 2011, 2020, and then again from 20, in 2021. And so, Mr. Dunn. Uh, thank you for inviting me to talk. Um, it is indeed good to see you all. I have three things that I wanted to say about Marie. Uh, the first thing was about her kindness. 
And um, I think about like the first time that I got elected and I was a new selectman and I was neither a herd nor a Greeley. And uh, that meant that I was different. And uh, she was so helpful. She told me who to talk to. She told me what meetings, like, you know, do I need to do this meeting? Do I not need to do this meeting? Who do I need to call? How do I convince this person? And it wasn't just me that she was kind to. She was kind to the people who walked into the office. She was kind to the employees. She was kind to other selectmen. She was kind. The second thing is, which of course is the, the reason we're all here, is what she did for the town. Uh, you know, she ran elections. She ran town day. Uh, Clarissa mentioned this, the connections she made. She knew everybody, she knew everything. And if you needed to connect with someone else, she would do it for you. She visited homes, she ran the, she worked on the credit union, she did holiday donations. Uh, she needed to help us send flowers for the funeral. She did so much for the town. And uh, the third thing is, is that she was my friend. And uh, I think about a day that I needed her help with a wellness check for a friend in Somerville. And that has nothing to do with her job. It has nothing to do with her, but she was there for me and I will never ever forget it. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. It's very touching, I appreciate it. You know, so, um, Mr. Lyons. So, you're still muted, you know. Can we override the mute? I'm trying. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're there. Hi, how are you? Fine. How are you? Well, I'll tell you. I, I first apologize. I've uh, I've got some eyesight issues, and uh, I particularly want to apologize to to Paul and Stephen and uh, and Heather and the three grandchildren for not being able to uh, to really attend Marie's services. She was a a valued friend and a great Allentonian, as as the other uh, selectman of. Uh, and prior selectmen have indicated. And uh, the, the, the thing I loved about Maria, she lit up a room, no matter where she was. Um, when, I, when I know of Marie's challenges the last 10 years or so and how brave she was uh, through, her, uh, through her sickness, uh, but she always had a smile on her face and she was always the vitality uh, of the town, uh, whether it was a running town day or, or whether it was inspiring poll, poll workers uh, to want to donate their services to, you know, working at the polls and, and counting votes and, and, and doing what, what we call uh, true public service. Uh, Marie was a public servant for most of her life, like her husband, Chuck, who died uh, prematurely when he was a member of the fire department. She had, as I know, she, she really had three major loves. Uh, first was her family, her, her husband, her two sons, Paul and Stephen, and then her daughter-in-law, Heather, and the three grandchildren, of course, that Jack uh, spoke so fondly about. But she loved her church, she loved her community, and she loved her, her fellow human beings uh, with abundance. And she enjoyed each and every select, and she made us all feel part of something special, and that was that was the town of Arlington. Uh, I'll tell you one funny story, uh, which, which I, I spoke with Jack about a little earlier. Uh, one time back in the, around 2004, Maria was uh, my guest. She came down to Washington, and I was uh, an officer of the National League of Cities. And uh, for some reason, uh, because we had to get all over the city uh, during the day, they, they, they gave us a car with a driver. And uh, when Marie heard this, uh, she quickly took the, the, the driver's card, and I didn't see the car for the next 12 hours. And, and when the staff of the National League of Cities asked me where the car was, I said, well, it's with Marie and, uh, and some friends from Arlington, including my sister. And, and we were stuck in a cold hotel uh, with, with about 4,000 city officials from the United States. And Marie was in the Oval Office of the president. Uh, the President Bush was up at Camp David, and, uh, and she convinced Mark Sullivan, who was then head of the Secret Service, who grew up in Ridge Street in Arlington, uh, to take her and her friends through a private tour of the White House. Uh, only Marie could get away with doing something like that. Uh, and the next thing I knew, uh, the next day, uh, 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 Don Barrett, who was the Executive Director of the National League of Cities, we had to get up, I don't know, to the Rayburn Building or something. and. And uh, he said, you know where your, your car is? And I said, yeah, and Marie took it again. I said, Bob Bloomquist, who used to be the Arlington Fire Chief, 
uh, he was a he was a mayor uh, down in uh, uh, Washington D.C. He had to get to the airport, and because Bob was a friend of Marie, but more importantly, was a former Arlington Fire Chief, uh, he deserved a ride to the airport uh, with her in this uh, in this wonderful uh, wonderful uh, driver who she became quickly friends with. Uh, Marie had a personality that knew no bounds. Uh, it had an impact on all of us. Uh, her passing is a great loss, not only for her family, but for the thousands of people in Arlington. They got to know her, uh, as many of us did. You know, uh, there's a lesson in the Wizard of Oz. Uh, when the Wizard of Oz puts a heart around the Tin Man, he says at the, uh, at the end of the show, he, he reminds the Tin Man that, that a heart is not measured by how much you love, but it's truly measured by how much you are loved by, by others. Marie Kropalka had the biggest heart in the town of Arlington. She was a woman that, that was loved and cherished by so many others. And I just want to thank her family, uh, her two sons and her daughter-in-law, Heather, and, and the three grandchildren for sharing this wonderful human being with us for so many years. She was a secretary to Don Marquis back in the 60s, to Bill Libby in the building department. Uh, and I, uh, I, I, I send my sincere condolences, as, as Clarissa said, to, to her family and to Michael and Stephen Byrne and so many, many others who, uh, who uh, were so blessed to call her a friend. Thank you, uh, Len, for giving me the opportunity to express some thoughts about such a wonderful human being. Thank you very much. God for bless to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us and the great stories. So next, we'll go to Mr. Kuro, Joe Kuro, who was on the board from 2012 to 2020. Mr. Kuro. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It's, it's, it's uh, great, great to see you all. Um, so I was, I was reading Marie's, um, and, and it, one of the problems of being late in the lineup is that there's probably a little bit of repetition, but, but uh, you know, uh, Marie's voice. Um, I was reading the obituary and, and it, um, it said how we had lost so much institutional memory with Marie. But I, I'd like to say that um, I, I think we actually lost the, an institution. She was the institution. She wasn't just the institution's memory. She was the institution herself. And there'll never be another one like her. Um, obviously, like a lot of us um, been talking over the last um, last week, week and a half with other people who, who knew and loved uh, Marie and hearing some of their their thoughts and you know one person was very close to said our champion is at rest and uh, i think that kind of sums it up i, I think for the whole the whole town i was talking to somebody else too and um, i said you know she adored you and and they uh, responded they said joe she adored anyone who loved the town of island and, and i think that that is absolutely uh, true um you know, there are a lot of us, and I'll plead guilty to this, where oftentimes we're trying to be self-reflective and figure out who we are and where we're going and whatnot. Marie knew who she was, you know, uh, kind of echoing what Charlie said. I mean, she was really grounded in faith, family, country, and community. Uh, I mean, we all, any of us who were up at the wake or, or, or at the, um, the funeral, we saw her church community was out in force for her. She was always there for them. Uh, we all know how proud she was of her, her son and her, her grandchildren. Um, <clears throat> and she was always, Dan said, you, you know, you said she was kind. I mean, some of her grandchildren would be in events with some of my, my kids, and, and she'd always have a kind word for, for some of my kids if it was a performance or something. And uh, as far as country, I mean, I think a lot about this. You know, we, when we, um, Right now, in these times, we hear all of this suspicion of election workers or attacks on them. And I always, when I hear that, I always think of what Marie put together, like, especially tonight, we're on the eve of an election, and how she personally knew all of these election workers. She knew where everyone was. She knew where the strengths were and all of the polling places, where some of the challenges were. And she, she brought in a team of people from across the political spectrum and whether they've been here a long time or, or new time. I mean, she was really staffing that of the engine room of, uh, of our democracy. And she loved that. She loved that. And I'll be thinking of her tomorrow um, um, with, with that. Um, 
And another like a few members mentioned that she would share opinions or whatnot. But um, one thing that was interesting, and I, I'd have to go back and look up the specific issues, but you know, Marie was a longtime town meeting member. And it was always kind of amusing every once in a while. You go back and you look at the voting records and you realize she voted against the board's recommendation on one question or another. But she never lauded it over us. She knew that her, her role was to, to just kind of implement and carry through what the board or what, or what town meeting had, had done. Um, you know, another thing I was thinking about, Marie, you know, since I left the board, a lot of what I've been working on is, is um, like nonprofit leadership. And besides money, things nonprofits talk about always is how do you, how do you recruit and manage and retain volunteers? She was a champion at that. She, she pulled together so many volunteers. I mean, election workers are, are pretty much volunteers. They get the small stipend or, you know, town day, every select tone event there was, she had her friends there to help sell the raffle tickets. Other so rotary dinner, she was always there to, to uh, staff the fundraising table. And as, um, you know, one of the other people I was talking to this week said, you know, she was kind of a mother to, to us all in some ways. And, and one thing that she always, she always made sure that her volunteers were well fed. You know, she she um, she made sure the election workers got their lunch and got their dinner delivered to them. She really labored over that. So the town day volunteers were well fed, and she loved it when she was putting together um, either the the the, uh, the dinners for to honor town day key volunteers and sponsors, or or our annual board dinner. She she loved to, to just like labor over the details of, of, of that for us all. Um, so um, we all know, being in the chamber, that we, that we always knew that Marie was watching. If she, even if she wasn't there, you know, when she was ill or whatnot and couldn't be there in person at the meeting, we all knew that she was watching. I'm sure all of us, one at a few times or another, got little texts afterwards, just kind of bumping us up, saying, "Oh, you did great tonight." It was wonderful to see you and, and all of that. And so I just sit here and just remind the current board that, you know, she's still watching. You. <laughs> she's still watching all of us. She's still watching the whole town. So we really miss her and, and, and we love you, Marie. And, and um, there'll never be another one like you. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kiro. Appreciate that. And last but not least, we have Stephen Byrne, Mr. Byrne. Was on the board from 2012 to 2017. Mr. Byrne. Hey, good evening, everyone. Um, it's so nice to see you all. It's it's a, a little reunion um, that you know obviously comes at, at a time when we or for a reason why we we didn't want it to be here. Um, so uh, I and uh, Chair um, Diggins, I really appreciate you inviting me to to say a few words um, tonight. Um, and since you reached out, I've spent a lot of time trying to think about what to say, and I don't know if there are words that can properly describe what Marie meant to me and the impact she had on my life. Um, I considered her family and loved her very much. Um, and, you know, and that goes back a long time. I think my first memory with Marie was probably walking into Grove Street when my grandfather worked there um, in inspectional services. And you just would see her, when I turned the corner, she would you know, turn, look at me and just open the third drawer in her desk because that's where the candy was kept. And we'd probably spend about an hour just chit-chatting about anything under the sun. Um, and you know, one of the, the last times we spent some meaningful time together was you know at my wife's baby shower for my now one and a half year old daughter and so i think you know we've heard a lot about generations today and so that spans what at least four generations for for us and and that's pretty special and, and she's obviously someone that meant a tremendous amount and made a big impact on us um and i know we we've all talked about and, and heard a lot about her commitment and dedication to the town and you know that that just can't be understated and un unlike some some of what my colleagues have said you know i would say if it wasn't for marie i probably wouldn't have served on the board of selectmen 
um, I think that's the type of you know, um, you know, where, where she, where she helped me to get in life. And, and it was, you know, that wealth of knowledge, you know, that, um, understanding of the town, the, the relationships that she had. And really, I, I think her, her long, you know, history of knowing and respecting and, and loving and being kind to people. And that's something that, you know, is obviously super special. Um, and, you know, I, I was thinking about, uh, you know, obviously times like this, you think about your time uh, on the board and, and the time that you get to spend together, um, not only with her, but but with all of us, um, if we were lucky enough to, to serve together. And, um, you know, I start thinking about some of the best times that, that or some of the most enjoyable times that, that I had on the board. And, you know, obviously, the, you know, the work was phenomenal. I, I loved my colleagues. I liked being out in the town. But, you know, the memories that come to my mind are, you know, um, hanging out before a selectman's meeting or a board of select, uh, select boards meeting in, in you know, the, the chamber or in, in the office and just really, you know, preparing for a meeting, but also just becoming friends and becoming, you know, getting to know each other. And Marie was obviously a staple of that, as was everyone else who worked in the office. You know, or, you know, the other memories are, you know, town meeting intermission, sitting up there with Kevin Greeley and Marie and, and anyone else who wanted to go take take a break from from the floor, um, sitting with her at firefighter retirement parties or, you know, just getting to, to talk to her on the phone and, and hearing about what was on her mind, what was going on in town. And, you know, I, I think learning more than, than you'd ever understand by reading any of the news sources uh, in, in town altogether. Um, so like everyone, uh, I'm going to miss her quite a bit. Um, I loved her as, as did everyone. And uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Mr. Barnes. So thank you all. And, and we did not have um, Kathleen Diaz here. She was on uh, the board from 1991 to 2006. And, uh, that's on me. And, uh, and so I should have come to another member of the select board, me a former member, to try to find information on her. But we'll continue to try to reach out to her. And if she wants to come and say some words at a subsequent meeting, we will certainly have her. So thank you all for joining us. And it was really a pleasure hearing from you. And, uh, the occasion isn't the most joyful, but but as I've said to many people, I think of Marie. You know, I feel I feel joy, you know, and, and certainly feel love. Uh, so uh, my colleagues we spoke we, two weeks ago um, um, in anticipation of her retirement, and so so if um, if more is to be said, we'll say it during the business. But at this point, we'll plow, plow on um, to the next item on the agenda, and that is the fiscal year 23 first quarter financial report uh, by Mr. Pooler and, and Ms. Cody. And, uh, so, um, it's gonna, we're gonna start with you. So, so and, um, one thing I know is that my colleagues read everything. And, uh, and so, so um, what we're gonna do um, is just be pretty much launch into um, Q&A with just a little bit of, um, Maybe you telling us I mean, what stuck out to you about this quarter and maybe some things that you think the board should pay close attention to or that you're paying close attention to. And then we'll just go down the line for questions. So, Ms. Cody. Sure. Ida Cody, Comptroller. You received the year-to-date budget. I hope you enjoyed it. So, like you said, I'm not going to reiterate all the highlights of the report. But I will say that we are right where we are supposed to be. We're at 25% in terms of both revenue and expenditure, and that's true for both general fund and um, all five enterprise funds. I will call out uh, just um, the fact that there are some variances on the revenue side, and these are strictly due to the timing issue, the timing uh, of the revenue collection. One of them is the, the motor vehicle excise, and that is due to the timing of the commitments received from the registry, those we're getting in um, around February. So we'll see a spike in, um, in excise collection around April or March. Also, the, the enterprise funds, specifically the rink, uh, due to their seasonal nature, uh, the revenue is quite low. It's about 2% right now, but most of the revenue is being collected in winter uh, months. So we'll see a spike soon in there. 
The expense side, um, we're right where we're supposed to be. Just a few departments appear to be spending higher, but that's because of the encumbrance process. Um, we encourage them to um, encumber the large contracts at the beginning of the fiscal year. And lastly, we are reporting at your suggestion the fund balances of the municipal trust fund and also stabilization funds. These funds don't have any tr uh, financial transactions except the offsets, which are po posted in the beginning of the fiscal year, as well as the contributions that we make into these funds at the beginning of the fiscal year. Also, we're posting a monthly um, interest income. That being said, if you have any questions, Thanks. I think you have the thing memorized, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so it's one, that's impressive. Me. So, so I'll start with Mr. Corsi. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, Ms. Cody, for the, for the report. We're still in the early phases of the fiscal year, but it's always helpful to, to see where we're going. And, and one thing that, from your narrative, that looks very interesting is just the um, collections for the hotel, the local room stacks. That uh, really suggests that that uh, is, is going to be a big number this year and, and something that... Uh, Hopefully, we'll help out the financial situation to the degree that that, uh, that can. Yes. Thank you, so. Mr. Corsi. Mr. Albus. Thank you very much. I um, appreciate the very clear memo. I was also very impressed that you did this for memory, which just tells me that you live and breathe his numbers. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> and we appreciate your mastery of that. And I feel like the town is in good hands with respect to tracking this really important information. Thanks for telling us, Mr. Hurd. Thank you. Move receipt. Um, and then, yeah, whenever we have these presentations, I, I go through the report and I'm like, I gotta find some questions <laughs> to stump you, but it's so clear that there's no questions to be had. So I, again, we appreciate these reports and it helps us and the public really to get a step-by-step -step, uh, grasp of the town finances. And we're always impressed by the well-managed finances that we have in town, so that's a credit to you, the town manager, and everyone in the finance department and all the department heads that work to uh, to keep our finances in check. So thank you. Thanks. And so I'll come back to the other Mr. Hurd for a second. <laughs> so he will proceed. So. I'd like to second that. Oh, thank you, appreciate yeah, that. Appreciate and, uh, and, and so, um, so I just have a clarification uh, question and then maybe one that's maybe a little bit out, out, of, um, out of scope for you. And, uh, and so um, on the fees, the collection rate of 40.9%, and you say the category is high due to ambulance and street opening fees. And we've experienced an increase in ambulance fees for two reasons, and you give the reason. So, so I'm just, I just don't understand. I mean, it's just, it's not that I question it. It's like, what? Please explain. You know, sure. So we call, we collect ambulance fees whenever we um, do uh, we get calls for service for an emergency for a medical emergency. We collect the fees from okay. the insurance companies. Okay. There's there's two types of services. We offer basic life services, which is just our fire department, and there's also advanced life services, uh, and that's when we uh, call the outside ambulance, the Armstrong. The amount that we pay the Armstrong goes into a revolving fund, but everything that's collected by our fire department for the services that we render goes to the general fund. Um, we slowed down a little bit during COVID because there were, we didn't have so many rides, right. but now we're seeing that people do go back to the hospitals. And yeah, I got it. Got it. Yeah, it's just ignorance on my part, I mean, so I just didn't quite understand it. So now, now I do, you know, so thank you very much. And so the one, the part that's kind of out of scope, and it has to do with me and some, we're hearing lots of complaints made about trash pickup. You know, so, so we've paid, you know, we've paid the contract already, right? You know, and so, so I guess, I, I, yeah, it says it encumbers this energy and trash collection contracts at the beginning of the year. And so I guess I'm thinking like for, for next year, I mean, if the performance doesn't pick up, I mean, I mean, is there something that we can maybe do I mean, so that we're not kind of, you know, paid it all out already? And I know that's out of scope, but it's just something I just kind of toss out there because it's like, well, I mean, it's a problem, you know? Um, I wasn't aware of, about the complaints, uh -huh. but I'm thinking if there are any, we can we can talk to the DPW director. I don't know if necessarily we can suspend payment. Yeah. Um, um, and not, um, if I may. Yeah, please. Um, 
we've encumbered the funds, which means the Department of Public Works has set them aside so that the money can't be spent on anything else. I'm not sure if we've actually paid the contract up front. We're not paying it up front. When we sign the contract, we encumber, we reserve the funds, and we don't pay. We just draw against that purchase order throughout the year. Gotcha. Okay. Yes, yes Mr. Hine. Just so you know, I'm, I'm fairly familiar with our waste collection contracts. Stopping payment is a difficult sort of last resort. There are other intermediary steps built within the contract, just so for the board's information uh, in terms of what we do when we're dissatisfied with service. Okay, thank you. This is all very, very informative and helpful um, for me. So, all right. Yeah. So, any other questions, comments? Yeah. Yes, yes Mr. Floyd, did you have anything else you wanted to add on that? We had a good discussion, but on, on the trash collection? Uh, no, I, I, I just wanted to make the point that we haven't just given them all the money up front that we, for our own internal purposes, we encumber. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. You know, so on a motion by Mr. Hurd to receive the report and a second by Mr. Helmuth, you know, Mr. Hein. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. It's a 4 0 vote. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Look you. Forward to another quarter, seeing in a quarter or so. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Have a good night. You too. Yeah. So uh, next we move um, to item number five for approval: the Veterans Memorial Park. Yeah. So we have uh, Mr. Chunglo, Director of Veterans Services, and, and is that Michael Cluckman? Huh? Yes. Yeah. All right. Senior Landscape Architect for VHB. Oh, okay. Online. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, here, uh, Michael Clutcher with VHB, Senior Landscape Architect. Um, here with, uh, I don't know if uh, Jeff uh, is in the audience from the Veterans Council, but um, I'll go through a quick presentation of the proposed uh, Veterans Memorial Park um, renovations. Um, I believe uh, Jeff has shared a packet with you, but if I can share my screen, I'll just pull that up um, to talk to here. Okay, so, um, the uh, Veterans Memorial Park uh, renovation project goals are really, it's time for a refresh. The existing uh, honor roll is, is in rough shape and uh, the space itself is not uh, ideal. Um, it could be improved for um, ceremony, for accessibility, um, and uh, safety of the walkways. Um, I'll run through this fairly quickly. Um, we'll get time for questions and answers afterwards. Um, so again, the current uh, condition of the, the honor roll, um, the, the site itself, um, uh, the site drainage uh, could be improved. Um, the soil is compacted and, and not graded uh, ideally. Um, there's any position seeding on the site. Um, and uh, some of the existing uh, tr trees are in, in poor health and some are hazards. Um, also wanted to point out the uneven walking surfaces, uh, again, addressing the accessibility issues of the park. Um, and quickly, there's opportunities here for, um, for cleaning and the application of cold leaf the existing uh, war monument, as well as um, in the design looking at uses for the, the backside of this monument. Um, we understand there's uh, concerns about tree removals in the town, and we've been uh, working closely with your uh, tree warden on assessing the existing trees in the site and going with these uh, recommendations, as well as then also providing uh, recommendations for uh, numerous replacement and improved trees. This is some of the correspondence um, that's been going on with the tree warden. Um, another question came up with the trees. Uh, there was a question about what um, what can we do for doing resilient planting and looking for the 
the future with uh, climate change and weather patterns. So again, we expected a few warning tones that suggested a list. We're, we're a little bit ahead of this right now. We're looking at sort of the outline design, but we definitely will take this into account as we move forward. Um, again, uh, Jeff's packet was, was excellent. It had uh, letters of recommendations from the Chamber of Commerce. Um, and also the, um, uh, uh, that was just a block in the chamber. So quickly, the, the proposed design, uh, one looks to renovate the existing site of the honor roll in front of the fire station to, to create a, a space that's open and have space for ceremony, in addition of uh, pen service flags, uh, stone, um, sustainable monument wrapping the outside of the space and also an interior wall, um, which would be engraved with uh, or have space for up to 14,000 names um, so they can be updated um, if needed. Uh, I think the best thing to do is to look at uh, a picture. Um, so again, this is a proposed uh, part for bird's eye view. So the existing kind of roll sits right in the middle of here, so this, this design would open up the center of the site, create a uh, memorial wall, which creates a, a space and a very reflective space to the site. So this is the existing memorials in the center, so the side that we renovated is on, on the opposite side from this view, but then a new uh, backdrop for, um, for uh, ceremonies. And then also these are the 10 a uh, service flag that we added to the design. Um, the other the other side of the park um, to, to the east become more of a passive park space with the seating, uh, more shade trees and a more structured, safe, accessible walkway to the center. And there's quickly some views of proposed parks. So then again, we're looking back at the fire station, uh, memorial walls, the names engraved, a wrapping space, and now back towards the, the Civil War Memorial um, with the more passive uh, park space with renovated landscape areas, improved soils and drainages and uh, shade and flowering trees. Um, again, this is all proposed project costs at a, a schematic level. We've done some budgeting, we've done some very good estimates on the memorial itself. Um, you know, some of these things are contingencies, like construction plans may not be that, that expensive to, to create um, at this point. Um, but this, this does give us a good budget for what we involved in doing the entire project, um, this approximately two and a half million dollars with the contingencies built in. So hopefully as the project moves along, we can um, reduce some of those contingencies and this is just our attachment of how we do these budgeting estimates. Um, I will stop sharing and I, um, again, for the time we have three questions, we have to answer. Thank you. Ian, Mr. Chungo, do you want yeah, to say anything? So I, I would just like to say that, um, you know, this all started a number of years ago uh, we are looking at alternative spots in town. We had a number of different locations that we were looking at. We went and met with uh, different groups of veteran groups, uh, public groups, and the consensus was that they wanted it in the center of town, which is great. So last year, uh, the select board approved uh, the designation of, of this site as the Veteran Memorial Park site. So the concept was uh, two sides actually we wanted to have one side that um, met the uh, intent of having a good honor roll and, and military history representation here in Arlington, along with another side, uh, the opposite side of the park, which is a park. Um, <clears throat> there's currently really no seating there. Uh, we don't conduct any services per se there uh, because it's not conducive to having the older veterans attend. Uh, there's no seating, uh, ADA compliance issues, et cetera. So, so that um, led us to this project, 
and we met with uh, the stakeholders at the very beginning, a lot of the town departments, uh, and came up with these, these plans, refined them with uh, the Veterans Council, uh, the different uh, service organizations in town, different veterans, uh, to come up with this plan design. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, so, um, I, so I the one thing that, yeah. that I will say um, is about the, the financing that we did uh, submit for capital funding, uh, but we increased the amount for the contingencies just in case because the way construction is going nowadays. So you'll see that difference between the presentation and what was submitted for capital plan. Thank you. Yeah. So, Mr. Hurd. First of all, thank you for your continued advocacy for Arlington veterans. Um, so just so I'm clear, since this is for approval, so we're approving the design that we see right there. So if we're yes. submitting a motion so, to approve. So the issue that, that I'm running into is uh, grants. Yep. So in order to apply for the grants, the project has to be approved. So and I'm happy to do so. I so that's, that's sure. where I'm at. So, so uh, I'd gladly submit a motion to approve the wonderful designs that we have in front of us. This is certainly long overdue. It's as far back as I can remember, and I think many people older than me will say they can remember that the Veterans Park has looked the same, and we can tell that it's looked the same for a long time as you walk through it. It's not just for the events that we have there. Just people walk through Veterans Park walk through there to go to Starbucks and it's tough to traverse There's the dreaded brick sidewalks that we've been trying to replace across the center um, but more than anything to have really inviting location to serve our veterans and to honor our veterans is really important and I know this the monument that you see here we walk I often walk through the center with my father his name's listed right there and he always so that was supposed to be a temporary thing. I think that monument was supposed to sit there for only a couple of years, and now it's been 23 years since. And, uh, and just to point out, it's lacking 12,000 names. Right. Um, so it's really, I'm really happy to see this go forward. And we do host a, a fair amount of events here, and I know we can have more if we have a suitable location. But even when we have visiting dignitaries we have events and sometimes they're in Arlington Center and I think sometimes I look around and I'm like oh this is where we're inviting people to show off the town so I think this is a major step forward that we can use to honor our veterans and just to utilize the space in a much more uh, efficient way so I'm happy to support this I think this looks great and I think it's very exciting to uh, move forward with this project Okay, thank you, Mr. Hurd. Mr. Corsi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Chungle, for the presentation, Ms. Bongiorno, as well. And, and it was a year ago that the board voted to designate that, to rename the park as the Veterans Memorial Park. And, and at the time last year, on, on Veterans Day, we, we received a very positive response from, from the public on that. But I think, as, as Mr. Hurd said, as you pointed out, Mr. Chungle, the fact that we are missing so many names from the honor roll is really critical. To, 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 to update that and, and to, to honor our veterans. And, and I think we're all in agreement a year ago and continue to be in agreement. This is the, the, the perfect spot to, to, to have the, um, the memorial and, and, and to improve the park around it. So I'm, I'm happy to support this as well. And, and hopefully this, this allows you to secure, or to help secure some, some grant funds or whatever other sources that uh, will become available, hopefully will will be available for this, but uh, it's very impressive and, and um, it, it's well thought out and, and um, happy to, to, to join my colleagues with this, to, to, to support this. So does that happiness include a second? I'm sorry, yes, yes that would be, yeah, happy is a synonym for second. <laughs> okay. and, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Great, thank you. Mr. Helen. Thank you, thank you for this. Um, I'm really pleased that it will be a proper memorial for our veterans and also that an important part of this design is a multi-use space to make it a spot for the community. I was just there actually at the, at the park um, on Saturday for an informal event and I was talking with a young family and, and I mentioned that we're 
talking to them about this plan. They were thrilled. They said they just brought their three-year-old there um, last week to play. And when I described some of the enhancements, they, were, they said it would just be a really great resource for the community. And I really like creating intentional community space in a place that centers our veterans. You know, I think that that'll be a really nice focal point for the community to enjoy, but also to remember at the same time. And not just when we're having events on Veterans Day, but, but all year round. So thank you very much for this. Uh, I just wanted to ask about the timeline. And is this going into the, you know, you mentioned the capital plan, you could just, w which year and what you anticipate construction schedule would be if it's funded. Uh, but, uh, you're up, Ms. Bongiorno. Yes. 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 Steve I'm the, the finance part of the, the team here. Uh, so as the Director of Health and Human Services, uh, Veterans Services is obviously within our mm -hmm. department. Um, so I submit the capital plan. What we've done is we've submitted it this year for next year uh, and the following year. So it'll be an FY24 and FY25 request. Um, that way we're able to break it up over two fiscal years mm -hmm. for the capital as well as for state and federal uh, funds that we're going for and other grants and, and other opportunities. So um, this is not an entirely capital funded project. We do anticipate, as we've done with many of our projects in health and human services, seeking out alternative funds to um, help support. We have a very generous community and I think a community that would like, would like to see um, this effort uh, put in place uh, for a number of reasons. And, and I think we can, we can certainly uh, seek out those funds. So this is a two year project. Uh, over the next two years. And as uh, Mr. Chung Lu had mentioned, um, we put a, a significant contingency in there, um, and that was in order to be able to address the, the growing costs of products um, moving forward. So, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad I asked because that was some, some rich information. And I, I think that's a really good idea to give the community the opportunity to be generous and, and to look for the under, other funding sources just to uh, keep the capital request. Um, uh, what, when it speaks. So, great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Holland. Thank you, Mr. General. And thank you, uh, Mr. Chunglo. And, and, uh, and sorry, the representative from VHB. And, uh, so, um, it, I really like that we're trading seven trees for 29. And I think it's good, you know, especially in, in that area. I, mean, uh, I know it's going to be 19 in that area and, and more across town, you know, I, I saw um, that the tree warden signed off on it. And, uh, did, you talk, did you talk to the Arlington Tree Committee? Um, so, so I did uh, last week, yeah. I spoke with one member, yeah. uh, <clears throat> but having the tree warden, you know, he was on board from the start yeah. and we had to do the assessment. So uh, it just dealt with Right. No, I, I, I think it's a, I think it's a good trade. You know, I'm, I'm just kind of interested in in, in their take on it. I mean, look, I'm, I'm wholeheartedly approving. I mean, I'm just I'm, overall, I'm just trying to work out I me mean, a, a posture I mean, towards uh, trees and and how, how we approach them when it comes to doing things in town. And I'm just trying to get a sense as to whether this is kind of a, a good model because I mean, we not only have trees that you're replacing in this area, but then ten more. I mean, so there are going to be 19 that are going to replace seven here, and then 10 more across town. I mean, and, and you're also, um, I think you're going to have probably a dis different distribution, not or distribution of species of trees, because as I read in the report, I, mean, uh, I guess there are a couple of maples that are being removed here, and we have an Correct. overabundance of maples that I recall reading from the tree management uh, report. Uh, uh, so that, that's good, you know. Um, and so I, so yeah. I think moving forward, the, the, the big thing for me was uh, addressing the future. Yeah. Um, you know, in addition to the trees, we're having uh, shrub gardens and things right. like that. But making a point to make sure that we're planting the right trees, right shrubs, that we'll be able to uh, thrive, I guess, in our ever-changing climate. So right. um, that, I think, is the other really important part. Yeah, I, I agree. Thank you. Did you seem like you wanted to say something, Ms. Yeah, Regano? I, I just wanted to comment on the tree situation. So we did, when we walked through with the tree warden, he identified a number of trees that had actually been damaged and are dying. Right. Um, and that do need to be taken down whether this project moves forward or not. Um, so I think it's also important to understand, too, that the root systems that are currently there uh, are such that these trees will die. Whether they're dying, dead, or, or still living, there, there are 
um, a number of reasons to remove these and to, to put these trees, new trees back with um, the systems in place that we see in other cities and towns that have just done their, their, their tree, um, you know, their centers like Lexington and other communities like that that are putting these, um, these systems in place that allow the roots to grow and for the trees to flourish. So it's important that we look um, you know, at that issue as well. So thank you. Sorry. Okay. No, 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 no. I appreciate that. No, no. It's all, it's all information. And one of the reasons I actually am asking people to do shorter presentations is so that we can ask more questions because I just love that. Just love that. Hearing the answers to my questions, but also hearing my colleagues' questions. You know, so I see Mr. Helmets. Yeah. Have you, have you Mr. No, I'll come back, but no, please. please, please. Uh, th thank you. Just, just following up a little bit on the trees. So, um, just so, just for our awareness, how many trees has the tree warden? signed off on for, uh, for removal in the, at least at this stage of the project, realizing that we're two or three years away from, from the ultimate construction. Yep, so they are in your packet um, with, the rec with his recommendations. It, uh, and it's, is it seven? Seven. Is that, that's, and that's the total that he's comfortable with based on, yep. on what Ms. Regina was saying, that they would, they're, they're not healthy or they're invasive and they're, they're kind of on the way out. And Correct. I know that we had, we had a similar uh, situation in Broadway Plaza where there were some existing trees that were not going to do well because there was, uh, in inadequate soils, so, um, so yeah, I'm glad to hear that, and I think I have a lot of confidence in his his expertise. Would uh, would we assume? Can I, is it safe to assume that as this takes shape, you know, because these tree, you know, it'll be two or three years from the trees, that the tree warden would still be intricately involved in in the guidance and the approval of of the final tree removal plan and planning plan? Oh, sure, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I'm very happy with that. Yeah. Oh, thanks. And so I'm just wondering if uh, Mr. Clackman wants to say something. I'm hearing some audio, so I'm not sure if you're trying to signal that you want to say something. No? Oh, um, my apologies. No, I, I not to answer any questions. Um, but, um, no, it's great, great discussion about the trees and certainly you know, love to be part of that conversation going forward. Well, I'll just add one more thing. And, and, and when we talked, uh, uh, Mr. Um, well, Jeff, sorry, blanking out. You know, um, um, and and um, it was on um, the cost of the, the honor roll. You know, and and, and you explain why it costs as much as it does. You know, and and I, I think it's beautiful. You know, uh, and, and but I, I did express me you know, some a wish you know, that it was more uh, interactive, educational. You know, that maybe you know, we could learn more about the the name. So what I'm happy is that the that this is this is ours. I mean, we're we're going to you know fund it, get some 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 grants. I mean, but it's ours. I mean, and, and and we can do more you know in the future if we we want. You know, but but I, I, I mean, when I see names, I mean, I mean I'd like to look, like know more I mean, uh, uh, about about the people. You know, and and so I think there will be opportunities later on. I think where we can really expand on this. I mean, make it more educational as opposed to a just memorial. You know, and so. So I'm, 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 but it's really beautiful. I mean, and, and the, the, I mean, looking at the, the triangle slash ring of trees, it's, it's just really look forward to. So I'm seeing it come to fruition. So I'm uh, Mr. Hurd. So I have one question, and I think I know the answer, but just to clarify. So on the honor roll, I assume there'll be space. Oh yeah. To add names. That if well, needed. hopefully we'll yeah. never have to add. Yeah. More sure. names, but. Uh, not likely, but yes, that was the main point. So yeah. as I mentioned, there are 12,000 names that needed to be added. Yeah. Um, and then having room for additional uh, names. Yeah. And the plan would be to unveil those on Veterans Day. If you had three or four new names, unveil those, and, uh, and we make sure that we have plenty of room. And I guess one comment. As I look at these pictures, if you could find a way to reincorporate the cannonballs, I know <laughs> the, the kid, the kids really like that aspect of yeah. Veterans Park right now. Oh. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chungo. You know, um, and so uh, uh, motion to approve by Mr. Hurd and a second by Mrs. Corsi. Mr. Hine. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. It's a four-zero vote. Thank you. Thank, thank you very, very much. much. Thank you, Mr. Blackman. Take care. Good job. Thank you. So, we now move to the consent agenda. Number six, request free parking for local holiday shopping by Beth Block, Executive Director 
Arlington Chamber of Commerce. Number seven, for approval, winter banners, Beth Lock, Arlington Chamber of Commerce. Number eight, holiday stroll in Arlington Heights on December 10th, 2022. Arlington Heights Community Association, Janet O'Reardon. And number nine, request contractor drain layer license, Julio D'Alessandro. D'Alessandro Corporation, 254 Pleasant Street, West Bridgewater, MA 0237. So, let's get set agenda. Mr. Mr. Helmets? Second. So, on a motion by Mr. Helmets and a second by Mr. Oh, I'm sorry. I just sorry. wanted to, because I think we have this as free parking for holiday, just to explain that it, it's Saturdays. In November, in the last Saturday in November, <coughs> and then December. That's when, the, and there's always free parking on Sundays. So, weekends in at the end of November and December, just so the public knows what we're saying when we say free parking. Yeah, thank you. It's not all always. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. We appreciate that. And and and, and with that, so. Um, Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Yes. Mr. Helen? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. It's a 4 0 vote. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, so we are now moving to licenses and permits for Pupil Common Victualler License, Duncan's 369 Mass Ave by Mark, was on Mark Pesky. Mr. Pesky? Yes. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Great. Great. So, um, Want to tell us what you're up to with Duncan's at 369 Mass Ave? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, I'm a long term Dunkin' Donut franchise owner in uh, other communities around Arlington and in the process of purchasing that particular Dunkin' Donuts from Dean Alapedi, the current franchisee. Um, no management changes or anything internally, just a change of ownership. Great, thank you. you know, Mr. Hurd? Move approval. And then um, I, have to, I use this Duncan's often as it's across from my office. And one comment just as I have you here, and I, I've always walked into that Duncan's in the summer and thought, like, I gotta talk to a manager here. Um, because I think the way that it's oriented with the sun, it gets really hot in there, which is not, I, I don't care as a commute consumer I'm in and out but I always often wonder how the employees deal with the heat that's in that particular um, Dunkin Donuts so just something to take a look at maybe talk to the employees see if there's something something that they that they notice and not just me yeah, it, and to see what it, you can do to help it yeah is it in the front the front glass is that so I think it's be my guess and I'm not being an expert, I think it's the way the sun beats into the front of the glass. But I just, for whatever reason, I go in there and often note how hot it is and just, you know, feel bad for the employees yeah. there. So just some food for thought, something to think about. As no, I thank you. We, we really care about our employees and we care about the community. We're excited about um, about this location. So I'll, sure. I'll look into that this week, actually. So, yes, Mr. Hallman? I have a point of Mr. Okay, Mr. Gorsuch. Yeah, I'll second Mr. Hurd, and, and uh, that happens to be my Dunkin' Donuts of choice, too, <laughs> uh, on Mass Ave. So I'm happy to hear that the, uh, the staff is remaining in, in, in place. I, I think I get there a little earlier than Mr. Hurd, because the sun is, in the, is, is bright. Um, but I, I can understand how that would be a problem as the day goes on. But i um, happy to see that uh, you're, you're coming in here, keeping the staff, and best of luck with the, uh, assuming we're gonna have a affirmative vote here with the uh, taking over the franchise. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. Helmuth? So, uh, well, I make the third person <laughs> who says that that's my Duncan <laughs> of, of choice meet. And, and um, I, I usually stop there on Saturdays meet on my walk home be from the gym in Arlington Heights be to, to uh, East Arlington and I get a frozen coffee and I used to ridicule, or just I just couldn't believe that people would drink frozen coffee, you know, <laughs> in in winter months, you know, um, 
and now I find myself doing that, even with a glove on, you know. Uh, but um, but yeah, and also I mean, you see, look, you own a lot of a uh, lot of Dunkins, I mean, so more power to you, you know. So build the empire, you know. So um, uh, so with that, you know, uh, uh, a motion to uh, approve by Mr. Hurd and second by Mr. Corsi. Mr. Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCorsi. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Evans. Four zero vote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Take I care. appreciate everything. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, so we now move on to open forum. And I just want to um, let people know that the forum item number 12, a, the preliminary discussion regarding government speech, that's going to be postponed. A, uh, so you can still make comments on it, but, uh, but we will be dealing with that uh, at another meeting. So on open forum, except in unusual circumstances, any matter presented for consideration of the board shall neither be acted upon nor decision made the night of the presentation in accordance with the policy under which the open forum was established. It should be noted that there is a three minute time limit to present a concern or request. And so uh, if you wanna speak, please um, raise your hand electronically and we'll take you in order. Yeah, see Susan, the stamps. I mean, I'm just looking to see if there's anyone else. Is um, we'll take the list and then shut it down. So I think that's going to be it. So um, we can bring the stamps in. Thanks. There you go. Good to see you. Good to be here. Um, uh, uh, just a few thoughts on the Veterans Memorial Project. I thought there may be a public comment period since it is going to be a public project. And I'd <clears throat> be interested to know why there wasn't or there doesn't uh -huh. seem to be. Um, we lost, but, we lost, hang on a second. On a second. We lost I'm second. sorry. No, hang no, on. Hang on please. We lost your audio. Okay, okay. All right. We're back. We're back. Oh, okay. Um, the, my first comment was I was surprised it wasn't some kind of a public hearing since it's a public project and I'm not aware that it has been subject to public comment uh, before this. And um, I want the board to be aware of that and hopefully that can be rectified before too many dollars are put in the ground. Um, the I looked at the material, I, I was the one who talked to Mr. Um, um, Chung Guo last week and he was uh, wonderful and the project sounded great. The drawings look wonderful. Um, I did review the materials after I spoke with him and I saw that um, uh, yes, our tree warden did assess the trees in your materials. There is a detailed letter from him about these, uh, the, the trees on the property and um, it's he says in the letter that there are four that he recommends to be removed. So um, not the seven that Mr. Chunglo said, I'm not sure why there was a misunderstanding there, um, but no, the tree warden did not um, recommend removal of all of the trees that, um, the, um, that they're planning to bring down. And I think that that's something that should be looked at before any plans are submitted for any grant applications. I would also like to know how many trees there are all together on that site. Um, Tim, I believe, talks about seven, but I don't know if there were any more. Um, on that same topic, I, I, again, I think it's a beautiful project. Um, I noticed that in the seating area, that big um, circle, there's, there's no trees at all. And I, you know, with climate change, um, nice weather getting hotter, People are going to need shade, and I would recommend, and also walking along that wonderful wall, um, memorial wall, I would I recommend that, they're, that they look into planting trees on the street side of that wall so there can be some shade for people going along the wall, and also a few trees in the middle of that circle that's in the meeting area, and until those trees can get big enough that they uh, consider putting up um, those shades, you've probably seen them made of cloth that are on poles that make these wonderful shady areas for people. Um, and, and Mr. Chunglo and I did talk about that. Let's see, what else do I want to say? Um, uh, the, and I just, um, the, 
it, when seven trees are coming down and 19 trees are planted, it's not by any means a one for one because it takes a tree about 20 years to become a really good shade tree. Um, so the, it, it, it happens in public projects all the time that all these trees are taken down and we're gonna have all these great trees, but the same way with Broadway Plaza, it's gonna be a long time before those trees are shading anyone. And for Broadway Plaza, I would also suggest the town look into putting up those, um, I don't know what they're called, shade sails or whatever. They're really cool, if you Google it. Um, they're all over the country in major cities. And I did bring it up once in the planning of Broadway Plaza. Um, I don't think anyone took it, you know, really paid attention, but it's never too late to install those. And um, I think I'm out of time and I really appreciate your listening. Thank you. Thank you, Stamps. Thanks for the comments. Uh, so I think that's it. All right. So we will now move on to number 11 on the agenda's discussion and potential vote Arlington Affordable Housing Trust Action Plan uh, with Ms. Kelleher, the chair of the Affordable Housing Trust, and Kelly Linema, assistant director of planning and community development. Hi, how you doing? Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. So. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hello, everyone. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, for the time to present the Affordable Housing Trust Funds Action Plan. Uh, would it be all right if I share my screen? Would you be able to see some presentation slides in the room? Sure. Um, I'm gonna, it, it's disabled right now. Screen sharing is, no, it's a lot. Uh, so I'll be brief with the slides to leave more time for um, discussion, as you have said is your preference. Um, and, but I did want to uh, present a little bit of an overview of what our process has been uh, in getting to this action plan. So with no further ado, I'll just... on the slide, but I do want to see you to see the other faces behind this report. In most of our public meetings, uh, multiple trustees have presented this plan and the preliminary information in the interest of time. You're stuck with me and Kelly tonight, but um, I want to acknowledge all of their hard work. I also want to particularly acknowledge Kelly, who has been in the trenches with us throughout and been extraordinary. I also want to uh, acknowledge Mr. Helmuth, your appointee to the board who has been um, an amazing partner uh, from deeply involved in this work with us. And I'll thank you for uh, appointing Vic Marie Santiago and Jack Nagel at your last meeting to keep our uh, robust uh, uh, board uh, going with some additional talent and connections. And I wanna thank Calpurnia Roberts who recently resigned but was a critical part of putting this plan together. Um, as well as all these other players who have been very well, helpful to us in getting to this point. Because we've been at this a long time. This is the very high level overview of the four steps in our process. Um, we did some prep in the spring, deep community engagement in the summer. We published a plan in September for public review. And here we are with a final plan for your approval. There are a couple more slides about that process. I'm not gonna go through them in detail, but I do want you to see the depth of community engagement that preceded this plan. Um, and it had a particular focus on those who are typically excluded from positions of power in public decision making who are most in most need and have the most interest in affordable housing, um, which included seniors, young people, renters, people who live in affordable housing, people of color, people with disabilities and special needs. We made a particular effort to hear from them. It's certainly something uh, we'll need to continue to build relationships and connections and networks to build the kind of trust that makes that effective and easy to do quickly. Um, but we feel we learned a lot from it. Um, we also were very intentional in engaging other town bodies, uh, public and private, that have an interest in housing. Because this plan, uh, while it is the trust plan, 
honestly, there are many stakeholders in town who are going to need to participate in achieving our affordable housing goals. So those organizations included the select board represented uh, by Mr. Helmuth, but also the Housing Authority, Housing Corporation of Arlington, Zoning Board of Appeals, the Arlington Redevelopment Board, CPA Committee, Department of Planning and Community Development, uh, and of course the Trust. So we met with that group specifically uh, before we issued a plan, and again, after we issued a draft plan to make sure we had input in alignment with those groups. And this is a list of steps we've taken just since we put a draft plan out to get public engagement. Um, most of these were public meetings or other forums where public was welcome. Um, and we obviously um, approved the final plan on October 20th and it came to you at your last meeting, I believe, and is here for approval. So this is a one page slide that's kind of a roadmap to the plan. There's a lot of info here, but uh, we thought it's helpful to be able to really visually see that there are three strategies in here. The first is about our existing affordable housing, which is an incredible resource that it's important to plan to preserve and modernize. The second is strategies to create more affordable housing because we clearly need more to meet the need. And the third is a set of strategies to build the financial strength of the trust, which at this point is relatively limited, but it will be necessary to build that in order to really achieve the long-term goals of um, having more affordable housing in town and preserving it. So for each of those three strategies, there is a five-year goal, just a very simple measurable goal because we wanted to be able to report to the public on some very clear goals. And in those boxes in the middle are a series of actions that we propose to pursue because there's going to be a lot of decision making along the way about which to pursue in what ways. We also adopted some guiding principles to help guide us as we make those decisions. And those are um, sort of highlighted at the top of the, um, the map here, and they are intended to be with us throughout the five year plan process. We think that these are ambitious but realistic goals. Um, and that they are steps that will create a strong foundation for the trust and the town to advance a proactive and effective long-term affordable housing strategy. So I have some slides about each of these three strategies that um, I would propose to go through if you'd like, but as, um, as Mr. Diggins said, you all have read the plan, I expect, uh, and if you'd prefer, I can just leave this up on the screen um, or take it down and we can take your questions and discuss it. It's sort of your, your choice whether you want me to go through the slides. I think there's some, some key insights there, but it's your, it's your meeting and uh, we're here to make sure that you get the information you need. Well, uh, oops, sorry. I unmuted my microphone, that was a mistake. Sorry about that. And, um, well, we're doing good on time. And, and you say that there's some key things there. I mean, my inclination, if we were short on time, would be to say if someone asked a question and you needed to go to that deck, to that slide, mm -hmm. we would go. But, but I think we're doing good. I mean, so so um, let's hear you know, the key points. They're pretty summary. Um, so we'll, we'll, they'll be pretty fast for some. Oh, these are just the guiding principles. I don't know that we need to um, spend much time on these, but they're here if anyone wants to dig in deeper. The only one that I would really highlight is number seven, the need to, you know, the commitment to collaborate and innovate with other town bodies and organizations and the need for those bodies to do the same with us. Um, that's probably the most important for town leadership uh, purposes. So the first strategy is about the 1200 units of deed restricted affordable housing units we already have. They've been built between the 1960s and last year and protecting them requires legal, financial and physical planning. This is a little challenging for the trust because we don't own those units, but the partners that we mentioned before do own most of them um, and have been very eager to embrace this part of the plan. Um, there's three, two planning steps here that would lead to a, a long-term affordable housing preservation plan for the town. The first is to complete an inventory for the town of all the affordable housing units in town, including exactly when do their use restrictions expire, how big are the units, what are the preferences for who can live there, et cetera. It's something that doesn't yet exist in that form and in a, a way that's accessible to the public. Um, and so we propose to work with DPCD to complete that and produce that. The second is to work with the owners of the existing housing to assess the capital needs of those properties so that we understand when they're going to need 
funding um, that they don't otherwise have access to where they might come knocking on the town's door looking for resources so that those, re those needs can be planned for. Those assessments, mm, excuse me, would also include looking at whether the assets that they have have the opportunity to add uh, additional units or additional affordability in any way. And I know some of those owners are really interested in, um, in using the opportunity to consider whether they can add more units to their properties or more affordability. So once those two are completed, we would work with those stakeholders to create an affordable housing preservation plan for the long term. It hopefully would not take us all five years to create that plan, um, but that's the goal that we felt was the appropriate goal for us to bite off in this initial period. Obviously, we, if we complete that earlier, it will lead us to other tax, tasks that need to be done. Second strategy is creating additional affordable housing. Um, and we really just wanted to anchor this discussion in the math problem that is affordable housing in that it requires subsidy. And it's substantial, and this won't surprise you because you all understand what the housing market looks like and how costly it is. Um, for rental units, and there's like peril in setting any number on how much subsidy is necessary because every unit, every project, every market is different. But we went through an exercise of at least putting a minimum number on the board so people understand the magnitude. And it's really four to $500,000 per unit of subsidy necessary to make affordable housing happen. And that's not necessarily getting to the housing that's accessible for very low-income people. That seems daunting when you consider the amount of resources Arlington has available for this purpose. But with experience and smart planning, there are ways to stretch our limited local dollars a long way, but we have to do other things. These are just some examples of how we can leverage other resources. I'll start on the right because this is a pie chart that represents the budget for the Downing Square Broadway project that the Housing Corporation of Arlington recently completed. That budget was approximately $25 million. Let's see the numbers here. I'm going to get the numbers wrong that are on the page here. Um, of that $25 million, only about 13% can be serviced by the rent and income from the property, which means the rest has to be subsidy from some place. Only 4% of that budget and about a million dollars came from town sources, while 83%, and that must be, it's about um, $22 million, came from state and federal subsidies. So it gives you an example of the fact that there are a lot of subsidies out there that are being used to leverage local resources and create this housing. We're not frequently asking for them. Um, and 2022 is an example of a year when in just the first eight months, at least $435 million of state and federal subsidies was made available in the Commonwealth. And we didn't ask for any of that because we don't have a fundable project in our pipeline. So our strategies are aiming to create that pipeline of fundable, deeply affordable projects that could qualify for those subsidies. And that is a time consuming process that will take years. There are, There is one other way to solve the math problem Number one here on this slide is what I just talked about. Number two is what everybody wants to do, which is to get developers to pay for it. We actually have tools that make that possible. The catch is you have to allow them to build market rate housing to get them to provide free affordable housing. And that is what we get in these two programs, what we call 40B or inclusionary zoning. There are ways that we entice developers to create affordable housing that they subsidize or cross subsidize from the profits of market rate units. So um, allowing this to happen, incentivizing it, creating pathways is part of how we can maximize our potential to create affordable housing. Obviously there's broader choices that are involved in that. So what are we going to do to try to make um, affordable housing developers come here and do strategy number one? Um, and or strategy number two. We're mostly focused on number one, by the way. Um, it, the same answers came from the develop, all the affordable housing developers we talked to. What are the things that would get you to come here and develop affordable housing? We need sites. We need a predictable path to get a permit to build. Obviously, building at a particular, I don't know, it's not obvious, I should say it <laughs> without the obvious, building a scale of development that's big enough to qualify for those subsidies is 30, 40 units at a minimum to be able to really get that deep subsidy. 
Um, and so permitting for projects of larger size, which is not something that's currently easy to do as of right in Arlington or really possible to do as of right in Arlington. Um, funding, um, there is a need for some local funding and creativity with that funding can yield particularly you know, results that we're looking for in town. Issuing a, a request for, of, for interest and qualifications for developers to come to town and work with us. This is something we think we can do in the relatively short term to create essentially a group of partners who are interested in working with us so that when opportunities present themselves, we can act more quickly. Um, and encouraging mixed income home ownership. And this is here because home ownership requires even more subsidy than the numbers that I put on the, uh, that I spoke of before. And there's very, very few federal and state subsidy sources for it. So subsidizing affordable home ownership could take a lot or all of our resources to create just a few units, which may not be the best outcome for the town, but allowing private development of home ownership to cross subsidize and create affordable home ownership may be our very best strategy. And it seems like such an important um, place for us to move the dial. The new 40B project proposed on Mass Ave is an example um, that if built as originally proposed, would create almost 30 units of affordable home ownership along with the market rate house, uh, housing. I'm sure that will change in size and be different in the end, but it is one way to get there. So our goal in this area is to create or permit 100 or more affordable units in the five-year plan. There's one pathway to doing that here. I can come back here if you'd like me to walk you through it. We, uh, we really thought we would be more aggressive in our goal, but we realized that 100 units over five years is 20 new units every year. And that's three times the average amount we've been producing for the last three to four decades. So tripling our production is a pretty meaningful next step. We thought it was important to be realistic here and set a goal that we feel pretty confident we can be with the we can meet, excuse me, and hopefully be with the collaboration of our partners. Last strategy is building the financial strength of the trust. Um, town meeting has sent a home rule petition to the legislature to impose a real estate transfer fee. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Um, that may or may not ever get through the legislature because of political uh, challenges to that, that are statewide. Um, we're advocating for it. Mr. Diggins is very involved in advocating for that as part of a statewide coalition. And we intend to keep doing that. If that is not able to be passed, that could create a sustainable ongoing source of revenue to fund the trust. We are likely to benefit, we hope, in our early years from the ARPA funds the town has set aside for affordable housing preservation. That will enable us to kind of jumpstart some strategies, but we will need sustainable revenue that exceeds what the town already commits to affordable housing to be able to really meaningfully move the dial on affording new affordable housing and preserving what we have. So if the transfer fee is not able to be passed, we'll need to move to a plan B. Um, our plan suggests we would try to get it through in this next legislative session, but if that does not happen, then we really need to move to a plan B at that point. We know this is a complex and challenging question for the town, but we did hear very strong support for affordable housing from residents if you didn't get a chance to look at the slides about our survey, which was almost a thousand residents, over 800 residents responded, so more than the usual suspects that participate in housing discussions, um, and was incredibly strongly supportive of affordable housing and new housing construction, quite honestly. Uh, some of the other strategies here are to secure our short term rental fees, cannabis sales tax, some portion of that revenue look for ways to increase uh, zoning payments from developers. I think we actually should change this language a little bit. Um, that's challenging, but we wanna push the envelope and, and pursue any legal strategies for essentially generating revenue from development activity happening in town. Uh, align our annual processes for different funding sources and consider a private giving strategy. And on that one, I just wanna be very clear, we have zero interest in interfering with or in any way creating confusion about fundraising for the Housing Corporation of Arlington. This would be something significantly different that might involve donating property or uh, other sort of creative ways to fund the trust. And we're back to the, the roadmap. 
So I am happy to take whatever questions you have. I don't want to prattle on because I know you've all read it. There's tons more detail there, but I think that kind of covers the high notes and I'd be happy to answer whatever questions you have. And also, Kelly, if you have comments you want to throw in, please, with the permission of the chair. Thank you, Ms. Kelleher. Yes, me, Ms. Lanham, if you have anything you want to add, please, by all means. I think just overall, just to really thank all of the members of the trust, They're, every single individual in the trust has done an amazing amount of work. And this is really, I think even just the way that this plan has come together and the amount of outreach we've completed to the community, to various stakeholder groups, to affordable housing professionals has really set an example for ways that we can work. It, it's sort of set the, the, the tone for, for ways that we can continue to do engagement going forward and we can build on that. So just, Big thanks to Karen, to Beth Gallo, to all the other members of the trust, to um, uh, Eric Helmuth, to everybody else who's been extremely supportive in the development of this plan. Thank you. Mr. Helmuth? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move the select board approve the plan, and I'd uh, like to ex just talk a little bit about what I think that approval means in practice. Um, and, and to do that, I want to express my appreciation for the wisdom of, of the, uh, the intent of this plan. I think it says in the narrative, and I, and I hear the voice of, of Ms. Kelleher in my head, of which means we've spent a lot of quality time together, um, and that word is alignment. This whole process has really been one of listening hard, of reaching out to so many stakeholders, and wisely so, because this is a big math problem, this is a big puzzle, and it requires every player, every stakeholder, who works on affordable housing, who has affordable housing development potential, who has affordable housing expertise, who has access to funds, political influence, we have to work together uh, to, to catch up and to reach our goals. And I really appreciate the, my colleagues on the trust and the leadership of Ms. Lanema and Ms. Kelleher and encouraging us to seek that alignment early and coming to the select board to say, this is, this is a work plan, this is a menu, this is what we propose that we as the trust work towards over the next five years. These are the ways, these are ideas for how we can do it. These are ideas for how we can get the funding resources that we need to facilitate that. But make no mistake, we can't do this on our own. We don't, even, even if the transfer fee happens, which I very much hope that it does, that won't be enough to meet the need. We have to use levers. And I think this document is a really, really good resource. And something that's just been enormously gratifying and humbling to me is uh, I'm sitting on this, this trust fund board as the select board's representative, and I'm surrounded with people who know so much about this who are professionals, make their living in nonprofits and developing affordable housing, and who are advocates and or who manage affordable housing properties. And I'm in awe of the resources that we have, of the, of the brain power and of the commitment and how lucky we are to have them here in Arlington. And this document is not only a work plan for the trust that I hope that my colleagues will, will vote to support, it's a really useful housing document, or document to understand for the community and to inform the conversations that we are having and we continue to have about affordable housing. Something I have learned so much, and I, I came into this thinking I knew something, not really, not compared to these folks. It is really challenging to do this at scale. It is really expensive. I, I know that if you read the narrative, that four to $500,000 um, subsidy per unit is a floor the real cost is probably higher, especially if you want to target affordable units for the really low income folks. And as I have listened to our healthy discussion and even debate about housing in this community, uh, something that we often hear is um, everyone agrees that we need more affordable housing and we mean that for people who, who have the lowest incomes. And that is true and that is a common community desire and it is a big math problem because it is so expensive to build very many at scale. And I really appreciate this document for telling the truth. That says uh, that we have to 
be realistic about what kind of public money is available to directly support these and how you leverage the funding. And a lot of that funding does need to come from developers' profits. And for that to happen at a, at a scale more than we've been able to do, we have to be willing to make some changes about how we view housing development. And yeah, we have to balance that with the kind of community uh, nature and, 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 and feel that we want. I think that's really important. We have to balance that with our ability to maintain town services. So, uh, so I make no comment other than to say that if we want that to change, and everyone says in good faith that we want more affordable housing, uh, we do have to realize that some things will have to change to make that happen. And I look at this plan and, and some of the other the recent plans that we've uh, developed, the Fair Housing Action Plan, the Housing Production Plan, as, as being honest documents and, and guideposts to say, if you want to make those changes, these are some of the things that we can consider as a community to do to make more of this happen, to, to make the math work, to pull the levers to make it happen. And um, I'm just really grateful to my colleagues on the board for listening so hard, for thinking so hard, um, for Ms. Linema, and who provides an enormous amount of, of often visible support and, and expertise. And uh, I, I'm excited about this. I think that we have some interesting discussions ahead of us as a, as a government, as a community, to put this into action. Thank you, Mr. Holland. And, uh, Mr. Hurd? Did, did you make a motion? I did. But, but I, I understand it for me to forgot that after my uh, unexpected sermon. Oh, that was <laughs> very informative as well. Second, I'll uh, second Ms. Holland's motion. Um, I want to thank Ms. Kelleher and Ms. Linema and all the trustees. The amount of information in this document is incredible. And the amount of time that it took to put this together, I don't even want to comprehend. I wonder how many trustees, when they took on this position, knew what was involved, but I'm sure everyone that we have on the trust does this for the right reasons, and they're on this this committee because they want to create more affordable housing. This has certainly been an issue that has been on the top of residents' minds in the past few years. It's been on the top of the town's goals in our goal setting meetings and we talk about affordable housing a lot because there's a need for it. There's a dramatic need for it. What I, as Mr. Helm has said, one of the things that I appreciate about this document is it outlines the challenges because in the political realm, when we run for office or we stand up at town meeting, it's easy to go up and say, we need more affordable housing. We need more affordable housing. Just create more affordable housing. And the challenges that we have as it, that are encompassed in this document are pretty dramatic. And it lays out, as Mr. Helm has said, that you either got to, for lack of a better way to phrase it, put up or shut up, right? We have to understand that if we want to create affordable housing, we have to, we have to utilize the tools that are actually going to create affordable housing. And it, you, I think some people might think that there's some benevolent developers out there that are going to build properties for a loss, but that's not the case. So if we want real me meaningful change, and I appreciate again that this creates a, a ascertainable goal, but it still is a goal that we have to work to achieve. It's not certainly going to happen on its own. We have to understand the type of developments that we have to approve as a town in order to achieve that goal. And it's gonna ha we're going to have to re-step back. And you know, I think for many years there's been the development to not be named th that we've been fighting against. That has allowed people to say, "Hey, you know, this is see, this is what we're trying to push back against." But it, we've seen a few development of a few friendly 40 bs as they call them, um, in the past few years that have shown us how a smart, efficient use of resources that can be incorporated into the to the neighborhood and the community around it can work in order to create affordable housing units. And we, if, as we continue to support such projects and sh let the word out that Arlington is a friendly place for developers of 40B projects to come and submit a proposal, we know that just to submit a proposal 
is you know a couple hundred thousand dollars in fees and costs to a lot of developers so they they're not even going to go through the process if they think that it's going to be they're going to immediately receive pushback if we can work towards a, a place where we can let these developers know that this is the Arlington community that wants to support these projects then that is that will move us towards the goal that we find in this plan and again I really appreciate all the work that's been done on this and I think this is a great framework for us to build off of to work together to achieve these goals so thank you thank you Mr. Hurd thank you Mr. Chairman and uh, yeah I also want to echo the comments of my colleagues thank Ms. Kelleher and Ms. Lynam for the presentation tonight thank the trustees and it's hard to believe the trustees were only appointed in September of 2021 and we have this report in a year it's amazing what uh, what has been accomplished and, and we I, I don't know what is seen on, over TV or on zoom but we were looking at an overview of the action plan it's on page 38 of the five-year action plan and that captures everything right there but I mean this this document was educational uh, for, for the background for identifying principles for identifying needs but it, it all comes together at the end with the, the, the three five-year goals to, to complete the affordable housing preservation plan, to create and permit 100, at least 100 affordable homes and, and establish sustainable funding sources. And just a couple of comments, and I had the opportunity to talk to Ms. Kelleher, and I appreciate the time that she took to, to, to review some things with me. But um, you know, just the need to coordinate among residents, among different departments, and, and um, whether it's leveraging resources and, and, and uh, just maybe even one of the first steps is a recommendation, which I think is an excellent one, to create an affordable housing inventory. I mean, just to know what we have, the condition of our properties, and, and, and where we may need to um, devote some resources to, to maintain existing affordable um, resources or, or, or units. Another thing, just a comment that really struck me, and, and really happy that, there, that Mr. Nagel from the Housing Authority is on the trust, and there is a representative of HCA, because all throughout this report you see how important the Housing Authority properties are in terms of the number of affordable units. But one thing that really struck me, and, and this I think goes to perhaps leveraging in, in the future as well, is um, Housing Authority has 427 Section 8 vouchers that are available to tenants, and tenants are using them, but only 39% of those tenants are using them in Arlington. And so that really suggests that, one, we don't have enough affordable units for these tenants to find, and two, really begs the question, are there other resources that we can find, other subsidies that we can find to try to find more units in Arlington? Now, I realize these, these, these are affordable units that are being used in the region, it's not necessarily a net gain for the region, but, but for Arlington, um, it seems to me that there should be a way to try to find additional resources for that. Other comment, um, again, goes to coordination, and I know you went before the redevelopment board. There's discussion in here about the creation of an overlay district, and I think that's a discussion that we should have as a community, whether it's an area or whether it's town-wide, certainly a, a discussion that we need to have. And um, another thing I would say in terms of financing, and right, right now the, the transfer fee is at the legislature. I think, you know, unfortunately, unless this is something that's done statewide, just being candid, and, and we said you were honest in the report, it's unlikely we're going to get this just for Arlington without it happening statewide. And I hope it does happen statewide um, so that there are more opportunities. But I just want to commend you for all the work and really for condensing all of the principles and all of the goals into a, an overview here um, that, that's easy to follow, but, but also comprehensive at the same time. So thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Corsi. So, yes, it's uh, a really good report. And, and, and I, you know, I've talked, I mean, I've read it all, I mean, I've talked, I mean, uh, so to a large extent, I mean, my questions have, have been answered. Um, I'll just make a few comments. I mean, uh, first is that I thought the outreach effort was very good, you know, and and it was impressive in its breadth, 
mean, and I, I think we often are disappointed I mean, by the, the, the numbers. I mean, but I think if we think that those numbers represent households, I, mean, I think we can be a little more encouraged I mean, by the effectiveness of the outreach because I know I mean, I mean, there are two of us in our household, but only one of us is engaged on town-wide issues, I mean, um, and the other one counts on 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 me, I mean, um, being able to communicate I mean, what the town is doing and being able to communicate his wishes, I mean, um, and so I think that happens in a lot of households, I mean, uh, that I mean, one person's engaged, I me mean, and another one isn't. I mean, in my case, I me, mean, I'm engaged on a local level, he's engaged on the state I mean, and, and federal level, so, so um, I thought it was a really good, good outreach attempt, I mean, uh, and, and I think it had some good results too, I mean, uh, from the numbers. Uh, the, um, the second thing is, um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll just ask the question now, I mean, um, and then say some of the things. I mean, I mean, what is it that the select board can do I mean, uh, beyond approving this? I mean, uh, and if you have some, some concrete steps that we could take, I mean, uh, if you have some some concrete notions that you can spell out now, um, that'd be great. But if not, you know, please get back to us and let us know uh, what we can do. I mean, it's as simple as trying to meet with the redevelopment board or, or maybe even the zoning board of appeals. I mean, uh, uh, more. I mean, happy to try to do that. I mean, although I think generally we have to, out of respect, I mean, wait for the invitation from those bodies, but just make it really clear that we're willing uh, to do that. So I'll stop and see if I can get a little bit of an answer from either or both of you. I'm going to go first, Kelly. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. Certainly, I just am very grateful for the deep engagement in the report that you've already made that investment of time and the thoughtful commentary that you've all provided. Um, so if you could continue to remain engaged and committed um, and use your bully pulpit as leaders in the community, particularly as political leaders, to have the honest conversation um, that we're having tonight, I think that can go a long way. Second, there's a lot of work yet to be done um, and it will need to be staffed somehow. Um, our seven volunteers are gonna continue to work hard, but we won't be able to get all of this done without whether it's consultants or additional staff at um, DPCD. Uh, we don't have a staff person dedicated to housing at DPCD. Certainly the trustees would love to have that. We've put that at Kelly's feet and at Claire's feet, and I know she'll put that at the town manager's feet before it comes to you, but in some way, shape or form, um, it's fair to expect that there will be requests to expend the funds that are necessary to drive some of these projects so that we can move quickly and make this plan a reality. Um, so those are the two things that come to my mind immediately. The last part, of course, is the coordination. You've already alluded to some ways that could happen um, and we'll keep thinking about how we can do that. We hope we will continue to convene the housing stakeholder group that we convened several times during the planning process, um, but we really welcome your ideas as well for how we can continue that kind of collaboration. Kelly? Or, yeah, if I can add on to that, I think one of the things I really, I knew going into this and one of the things I really discovered as part of the whole engagement process around this plan is that housing and affordable housing are very difficult topics. They're also very hard to understand because there's a lot of technical in language that people use when they talk about housing, when they talk about affordable housing. And, and we really have a lot of education that we need to continue to do. So I think that's one of the, it's actually one of the, one of the tasks of the trust is to continue to work on education. It's one of, one of the things that I have a passion for in my job. And I think one of the things you know, as we go through this, we realize that there's there's policy change and regulatory change and financial change that needs to happen. And so all of these things are gonna require complex conversations. Um, they're gonna require local leadership, but they're also gonna require local leadership to stop and ask us questions if we're presenting things that just don't make sense. Like I, I, I really appreciated throughout the process of this plan, hearing from people who just, who were just like, well, wait, explain 40B to me again. Like, who really wanted to have an honest conversation about what certain things meant. And, and I, I am always happy to talk through questions with people when they have those kind of honest questions and really want to understand, and because they're seeking to understand. They don't have to always agree with me, but I just, I want all of us to be starting from a place of truth. And I think if, if 
our town leadership can also start from that place of truth and by asking sincere questions. If you don't understand certain things or if you have questions about a zoning amendment that's going to town meeting, I, I, we want to know why. You know, we want to we want to know what can we do to explain this better. Um, so that would be the commitment that I would hope from the select board is just to really be willing to ask why. And if you do understand something to help us to continue the education that's required in order to, to achieve these five-year goals, these really ambitious goals that the trust has set. Well, thank you very much. And one thing that would help with that is if um, you could send us the slide deck that you presented, you know, because uh, we'll, we'll add that to the Novus agenda. It's a nice um, digested version of the report I mean, with, with, um, with lots of um, good graphics, you know, so. So, um, and then, and then I will just add with respect to alignment, I, mean, I see some potential uh, there. I mean, you, you mentioned me, you're continuing to work, I mean, collaboratively with the HCA, you know, but um, I, I could see the, some synergy perhaps be with the MBTA communities initiative, you know, and, and also I, I could actually see the, us applying or trying to work with the MPO to do a corridor study you know, uh, along Broadway and into Somerville. You know, what's nice about that is it brings Somerville mm -hmm. into the picture, which is very much part of the whole regional aspect of the MPO. And, and if we could get a complete street program out of that for Broadway, you know, I think the impact on transportation you know, mm -hmm. would, would be great. And, and, and you know, as I often say, if we can make it such that people can get from point A to point B, less expensively, I mean, they can apply those savings to housing and that makes the housing a lot more affordable. Uh, and, and so um, I just put that, that out there. I mean, and, and lastly, I'll say that I am looking forward to understanding I mean, uh, more, or well, getting a better picture of what amount of funds we need um, in order to sustain this effort. I mean, towards the end of the study, you say that we just don't know yet. You know, um, and so, uh, look forward to find out what that num number is so that we can then advocate uh, for for that number because I think there are a lot of people in the community as um, Mr. Hurd has indicated would, are willing to uh, put 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 our money where our mouths are you know so we just need another number uh, so so I um, mean so that's it you know so so um, thank you very much and, and I think with that on a motion to uh, approve is that's the right Work for this, you know, uh, by Mr. Helmuth and a second by Mr. Hurd, Mr. Hein. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Yes. Mr. Helm. Yes. Mr. Diggs? Yes. It's 4 0. Vote. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You know, so now we're on to, well, as I said, we're going to postpone uh, item number 12. It's just going to be a preliminary discussion. You know, on government speech policy, you know, and uh, we'll now move on to correspondence received. You know, so we have concerns regarding the cost crosswalk at the intersection of Highland Avenue and High Haze Road by Ann Chen, Monomy Rocks Drive. There's a lot of signatures, you know, and uh, number 14 is the Alewife uh, Brook CSO uh, update by Kristen Anderson, you know. Uh, which uh, had, had some um, interesting information about um, um, odors, you know, um, and, and I'd gotten some um, queries from residents about that, so it's good to hear that, you know. So, so um, I turn to my colleagues. Move receipt. Okay. You know, <laughs> so I'm hosted by. You stumped us. <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> It's still late. Huh? <laughs> um, I'd like to second that and suggest a referral to TAC on the first item. Yes, thank yeah. you. Uh, so. Which was requested by the Yeah, and, and my, my kudos to the residents of that neighborhood. That's, that's a, an impressive uh, bit of organizing, and I think that correctly gets the town's attention. Yeah. So, all right. So, on a motion. To receive and, and then forward on to attack the first letter uh, by Mr. Hurd and a second by Mr. Helmuth. You know, Mr. Hyde. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Corsi? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. It's a four zero vote. Okay, great. So uh, I'm going to move on to new business. 
Uh, now, yeah, so I'll turn to Mr. Hurt first. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think we've all talked about this, but we certainly were saddened to hear of the passing of Marie Kropelka. Um It was amazing service. Um, my heart goes out to her family and her friends, everyone that she touched. Um, you know, Paul, her son, did an amazing eulogy with, as I think Marie would have liked, a little laughter, a little love. Um, and then to her, her son, Stephen, who I know has really been her caretaker over the past couple of years. You know, I, thoughts and prayers. So, you know, I didn't want to go on beyond, beyond what everyone has said. But I thought it was fun. We often talk about the things that are important to Marie. And everyone has, te I'm sure every, after she passed away, everyone looked back at their text with Marie. And I just wanted to read too, because it's, it's funny. All right. Just wanted you to know some exciting news for hockey coaches and players. Maddie got a hat trick, and her sister Julia got the other goal. And Maddie assisted. 4 0, beat St. Mary's a Lynn. St. Mary's a ranked. Second in the state and are in a state of shock. Go Arlington. I'm sure you remember St. Mary's. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Hockey stick, hockey stick, hockey stick. Christmas tree, Christmas tree. Shamrock, 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 shamrock. The last one I got. And this, I think this one kind of spans all of our interests. John, great job at the meeting tonight. We're not having Patriots Day because of COVID, etc. Call me tomorrow anytime after 11. Watch Mass, etc. from 8.30 to 11. I'm assuming you know that Father Mark's brother passed away. He wasn't feeling good for two weeks, but I don't know what happened. Prayer, prayer, heart, heart, heart. Shamrock, shamrock, shamrock. Hockey stick, hockey stick, hockey stick. Panthers won 9-2 tonight. He, Paul, not the team, is on a roll. Girls hockey won one nothing against Reading. And... You just, I mean, I could probably go down 50 more, but it's just this, those are the things that you get from her late, it might be 11 at night after a long meeting, it just makes you laugh before you go to bed, so that was the type of uh, joy that she spread, so she will certainly be missed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Uh, Ms. Ellen. Here, here. Uh, well said. No new business. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and, and I also want to send out um, prayers and, 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 and our thoughts to, to Paul, Steve, and Heather, and, and, and um, Stephen's three daughters. And, and um, I did the same thing Mr. Hurd did. I, did. I wasn't prepared to read any, but I went back over old text too and, and, and the updates and the emojis. And I um, remember a couple times, sir, Paul used to be with the Carolina Hurricanes. and. I didn't want to have to tell Maria, I, I can't root for them tonight, Maria, because they're playing the Bruins, but we get into discussions about that. But it, it's, um, it, it was a, a, a wonderful um, celebration of her life. Um, and, and I thought Paul did an outstanding job um, that, that day, very emotional, but, but, but uh, really an excellent job. And um, we all have great memories of Maria, and we'll, we'll carry those forward. Um, so that's all, all I have on, on new business, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I'm sorry, but we'll say the best for last. Mr. Fuller, <laughs> for new business. <laughs> I have but you're not last, so. <laughs> <laughs> I have no new business, thank you. Mr. Hyde? I have no new business, and Marie's text will die with me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make sure you, you have those backed up, in case it's not to have to be fun, you know? No new no business. Right. You know, well, you know, so for me, a little bit of new business is that I'll, I, I, um, I have read the, the tree management uh, report that was created, plan, tree management plan. It's a really fascinating plan. I, you know, I think it was uh, created back in 2018, 2017, you know, uh, and uh, I, I, I would like to um, maybe um, get a report on, on, on where, where we stand um, with it, you know, so. Uh, I've been meaning to call you, Mr. Helmets, you know, so I don't, I mean, this is like a request for us to think about it, you know, I and mean, so I'm not making a form request now, but just say I think of, uh, uh, and then Ms. Amps did voice some 
concern. I mean, as I said, we need, I'm trying to just come up with a posture on trees I mean, for dealing with this and other issues I mean, so that we have some consistency with respect to how we you know, handle trees because he, yeah, I mean, there'll be other cases where they come up too when it comes to development of parcels. I mean, so, so there's that, you know, and, and for my uh, Marie um, story or um, statement, um, he, I went to the wake and you know, I wasn't able to go to the funeral, but I was able to go uh, to the burial. And, and whenever I would go to Marie's place, he, she would always express the shock that I walked there and, and, and that I was planning on, on, on walking back, you know, um, to wherever I was going. And so um, I walked to the cemetery and I walked back and I considered that my final act of defiance, you know, so, 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 um, so it, it, and I really did think about it, of course, me both ways, uh, and also I continue to think about it here whenever I come here, because as um, Mr. Burns said, I mean, um, I wouldn't have done this had she not um, approved it. It wasn't going to be a matter of her saying yes, it had to be an enthusiastic and authentic yes, and that's what it was for me, so, um, so, um, with that, you know, I guess what I should do is look for, since it's on the agenda, one more open forum. And I don't see any hands there. Yeah, I think we're all set. But if someone wants to put their hand up, now's the time. All right. So I think we take a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. And so a motion by Mr. DeCourcy, a second by Mr. Hurd. <laughs> Mr. Hi. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.